it's your favorite retro girl, 80s child, aka Lisa, coming at you with another Suits episode review for Season 8, Episode 5, Good Mudding. Now, I just want to put in some codicils before we start. One, if the background that you see as this video goes on gets a little pixelated, I apologize beforehand. I'm trying out this feature in Photo Booth on my Mac that allows you to put background pictures on, and it took me for fucking ever to find a position that this computer could stay in where it wouldn't have a big blob of white mass that you might see in front of me or behind me. <laughs> you have to, like, this thing is so sensitive, you can't even have shadows bouncing in, in the background or it will mess up the way that the background looks. So I had to, it took me a while to get the computer to position itself properly and even still, there's, it's not entirely perfect, but anyway, it's as good as it's gonna get. And two, um, I also apologize. My voice is a little froggy. I'm getting over a cold. Trust me, you'd be glad to hear me today rather than two days ago when I was when it was even worse. So, back to the matter at hand. Good money. Okay, um, I gotta tell you, I was worried going into season eight that because Rachel and Mike, uh, Patrick J. Adams and Meghan Markle were leaving that the cash shake shakeups and all this other stuff was going to be a, a hitch for the show. But really, season eight has been some of their best stuff yet. I know that it's not like... It's not as heavily on the cases as we're used to. But then again, in seasons past, we've also been very used to like entire seasons being devoted to one case or entire seasons being devoted to keeping the firm from falling apart. So this is a really big difference. Like the firm itself is not in trouble. Aaron Korsh already said that this season they would not have to worry about it. He's already put the firm through the ringer enough times and, and the, res the respective partners that that part is over with, you know, Mike is happy, Harvey's okay, everybody's fine, this merger is the one that's actually gone through without issues. Yes, there was bumps in the road, but that's normal for any, you know, that's normal when any two new companies come together, because it's like a marriage, you know, you have to, you've lived apart all your lives, and you come together, and you have to figure out how to live as one. So, you know, those those growing pains and those bumps were absolutely normal, but there's nobody physically coming to get um, Zane Spectre lit, so that is not a problem. And there's no one physically coming to get any one person on the show. No one's going after Harvey, no one's going after Zane or Alex or anything like that. It's all just related to everybody's individual cases. Which is kind of a breath of fresh air a little bit because everything was... The last couple of scenes was so dramatic with the, oh my god, is the firm going to fall apart? Oh my god, is Mike going to go to jail? Is he going to get out of jail? You know, it's nice to have a little bit of lightness. So, I have to say this episode, again, of out of 10 stars, I would give it at least an 8. And the only reason I don't give it a 10, small issues, biggest one being named Sheila. <laughs> okay, um, this is not gonna be a video shitting on the actress who plays her because I do adore her. I also am a looser fan and I love the character that she plays there. Love ya. Um, so this is not anything against her. She's a great actress and she's just playing the character as it's written. Um, I just do not like how Sheila's ass is coming across this season when I will get to that as we go further into the review. Um, <clears throat> again, this episode is on three fronts. The first one being Lewis and Sheila, again, con continuing to try to, for a baby and some serious roadblocks and issues that they're, the two of them are having as a couple concerning whether or not they're ready or, in Sheila's mind, if Lewis is ready to have a baby and some things she does, some not so... I, I'll, I'll say some shady shit that she does that it, it, I really don't appreciate. Um, the second one is, of course, Harvey's um, family problems going on with his brother's divorce. 
and all of the shit that rolls downhill with that. And then we have the third story, which is Alex having some problems with his 15 year old daughter, Joy, who is spending a couple days with him at the firm because she's been suspended from school for getting into a fight or doing something. He assumes it's a fight, but he's not sure because he's trying to get her to tell him, but she, she won't talk to him because he's not a cool one. And, you know, he's having problems talking to her and trying to get her to open up to him. So he thinks that Samantha being, you know, the cool lawyer in the firm might be able to get her to open up woman to woman. Basically, overall theme of this, this episode is family. Each main character is fighting their own familial battles and dealing with their own family issues legally and personally. So let's start with Harvey first. I started with Lewis last week first, so we'll shift this this week. We'll go with Harvey because Harvey's was like the main storyline for this particular one. It's interesting that this season, I don't want to digress here, but it seems like no one is getting the limelight. In past seasons, certain characters would get the limelight, others would be like the obvious B story. But this season, Korsh has done a really good job of making sure that no one character is in the limelight, that everyone has equal time. So it's hard for me to decide which is the A story because they're all, they all have equal time. Even the newer characters have as much equal time as the old standards. So it, it, I, I really like that. It gives everybody equal footings. Nobody is better than anybody else. I mean, we all have our favorites, of course. Harvey and Donna, but I mean, you know, dynamically wise, everyone is on an equal foot, which is good. Back to the review now. Um, so, everything seems to be cool with Harvey, you know, for the first time in a long time, he seems really content, like, the firm is okay, which it hasn't you know, it's been a roller coaster for at least the last two years, and now finally he's, he, he seems like he finally has the chance to breathe. You know, he doesn't feel so clamped about whether or not the firm is going to disappear, or whether or not he's going to uh, fail Jessica, as it were. And also, he seems like he has a lot of, a lot of the stress he had of being the managing partner seems to be off his shoulders now that Zane has that responsibility. He doesn't seem so stressed and so tight anymore. He's like, he can breathe, which is, is good because Har or stressed out Harvey is not a happy Harvey. <laughs> I mean, I know Harvey thrives on stressful situations and, and crazy things happening. That's kind of how he, that's his bread and butter. That's how he works so well as a closer and as an attorney. But, um, in a lot of ways, his stress is also not good for him because it's been it's been a big hurdle for him to to um, overcome. But he's learned through various ways, through therapy and oh, with his friends and having Donna there, that he's learned various different coping mechanisms for getting through that stress. And I think one of the major coping mechanisms was uh, over the last couple ep episodes it was really figuring out how to say goodbye to Mike. Even though Mike was gone, he was still holding on to his memory and doing a lot of things the way that Mike would do them because he had not yet accepted that Mike was gone. And this was the first episode where, you know, actually, yeah, this was the first episode where Mike was not mentioned. Mike or Rachel at all, not mentioned. Um, so I think the, the baton has finally been passed and, and, and Harvey is kind of comfortable now. He's okay. He'll always miss Mike and Mike will always be here. But I mean, he's always just a phone call away, right? But he's, he's, you know, got to a point where it's, it's not constantly preying on his mind. So he's content, which is good, which is good. And he's comfortable and he seems happy. Like, you know, everything seems to be okay. He walks in morning, says hi to Donna. She's the first person he sees. His first, he, she's the first hi in the morning, the last phone call at night, which, okay, before I go any further, I'm not digressing now. I'm actually making a point here. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, me, cold. 
Over this past week, on Twitter, the Suits Twitter gods, whoever is running the, the USA Twitter platform, has been really, really, like, killing it with the Darby stuff. Where do you think I got the background? Um, and a lot of times, like l last week, they posted a picture of, you know, Darby flirting over the copy machine. And I know a lot of the responses that were like, Psh, really? Bitch, please. Because the scene had nothing to do with them. They just happened to be in it. But it, it was not a Darby moment. It was just, they were talking about something completely out of context like it had nothing to do with them personally so we were all kind of like why are you putting this scene up here but it had nothing to do with them and you're posting it going is this a darby moment after the episode has already aired i don't know if that was an error or an intentional thing or what but it seems like this past week the twitter people for suits have gone darby gazongas of all of the posts they have done Pre-episode, I'm talking not post-episode, pre-episode, a majority of them have been Darby. <clears throat> and we were starting to kind of be like, is, do we need to know something? Or are, we, are we supposed to be expecting something? I mean, what we did know was that there was supposed to be a cute little scene between them having to do with strawberries and whipped cream. We were expecting that. But what we got was more than we ever could have expected. And it raised a lot of questions. And I guarantee you, if you go on YouTube or Twitter or Facebook, any of the, you know, Darby type sites, you'll see a lot of people are talking about this. And not just because she mentioned strawberries and whipped cream. That's minor. The bigger deal is uh, the whole dynamic between them has shifted. And people can feel it. There's something going on that I think suits people are not telling us. So maybe they are in their own sort of way or trying to get us to kind of like, or dropping hints. All I have to say is, okay, the, the major theory is that some people think that even though Suits season eight took up directly after season seven, literally at the wedding, some people believe that Donna and Harvey got together probably the night of the wedding or shortly after, and that they've been together ever since. Or possibly could have gotten together shortly after they that hug that they had when they made up. Uh, and that they're just keeping on the down low. And that, that's the why the suits people are, you know, throwing those little tidbits in there so that we can have some sort of twist ending at the end of season eight where they show us that the two of them have been together all along. Okay. Here's my response to this. That's a good theory. And there's support for it. And I will tell you where. <laughs> but if this is true and they do do it this way, prepare for backlash. That's all I'm going to say. Because we have spent seven years into our eighth now waiting for this couple to get together and if we are if we have that moment taken away from us and then at the end of season eight you just drop in this whole oh by the way they were together all along Tee -hee. oh they were together all along sorry um yeah that's that's not gonna work because we I don't like to sound like an entitled fan. We've been strung along for seven fucking seasons. Seven. Into our eighth now. We deserve to see something. Some sort of scene that shows them acknowledging. Getting together some way, somehow. If they've been together all along, at the very least we deserve a flashback of some sort that points to how this all went down because it wouldn't be fair otherwise for us to just accept oh okay yeah they've been together all along 
Are, are you serious? <laughs> Give us a break here. So, in the primary A story, Harvey is dealing with some family issues having to do with his brother Marcus. Now, last time we saw Marcus, Harvey um, had gone to make amends with his mother and things weren't quite working out. They got into an argument and Marcus dropped a bomb on him that um, apparently in the past Marcus had had cancer and it went into remission. What Harvey didn't know was the cancer had come back. And because Harvey was so wrapped up in his own life and not wanting to deal, to deal with his mom and not really taking a lot of time to be with his family a lot because you know he was so doggedly focused on the success of the firm and his own personal success and his own personal bullshit that he kind of left his family go by the wayside for a long time. Um, he didn't even know that Marcus had had cancer again. I mean, he was, it, it, it's okay now, but you know, the only person that was, the person that was there for him other than his wife and his children was his mother. She was the one that took care of him, that made sure he went to chemotherapy, that, you know, took care of the kids when he was too weak to, to take care of them. You know, he had no idea this was even going on. So this kind of motivated him to pick his relationship with his family back, back up and be a little more dedicated to them than he had been in the past. That's, that's, that's definitely a good thing. <clears throat> so Donna comes into the office that morning and tells Harvey that Marcus has called her. Now she, because she's known Harvey for, she's been with Harvey for a long time. She knows that when Marcus calls, usually if it's no big deal, he'll just call Harvey, hey bro, what's up? You know, if it's just a, you know, chill out talk. If it's something serious, he calls Donna. Because Donna will make sure to impress upon Harvey the need to call Marcus back. So she tells him, look, he called me. That means it's important. You need to talk to your brother. So Harvey calls him up, and it turns out that Marcus fucked up, did something no-no. He claims that he got caught having an affair, and at first I was like, oh shit, because that's the one thing, I mean, that is the one thing you would think that he would never do, considering what happened between their parents, you know, what their mother did to, to their father, you would think that he would not do something like that. But then again, you have to remember that when all of that happened between Harvey and Marcus's parents, Harvey is the older of the two. And what most people don't realize is Harvey's actually a good couple years older, um, more than two, probably even more than four. Harvey was old enough at the time to understand what was going on when he walked in on his mother in flagrante with another dude. He knew. He was old enough to understand. Marcus was very small and didn't, was too young to understand. So Marcus did not have the same perspective of what went on as Harvey does. And he didn't really grasp what was going on until much later when he was older. But anyhow, so he asks Harvey, he says, look, she's petitioning for divorce. If it was just a property thing, I wouldn't ask you to come up here. I would just take care of it myself. But I'm terrified she's going to take away my kids. I can't lose my kids. And he's desperate because they're, you know, the kids are all he's got left at, at this point. And so he begs Harvey, please come up here, help me. I need a closer. I need, you know, someone who can bang the gavel. Harvey initially doesn't want to really get involved because it's a personal thing between Marcus and his wife, but then again, this is family. and He can't just not be involved. So he says, okay, okay, I'll come, but when I get there, you've got to tell me the whole story. I can't help you if I don't know the truth. I don't want to be caught in any kind of lies. <clears throat> he says, thank you, thank you, because in, in Marcus's mind, he doesn't want this to be surgical. He wants the howlitzer, as he calls Harvey, someone who can get the shit done. 
to make absolutely certain he doesn't lose his children. So he lets Zane know what's going on. And surprisingly enough, Zane is understanding and says, hey, you know, you take care of family first. And then he lets Donna know what's going on. And she's like, are you serious? Because she knows too about what happened between their parents. And she could, she, I mean, she can't believe that Marcus would be so, re the last time that she heard from Marcus, everything was fine. And, you know, so she can't believe that he would do something so stupid. But, you know, she knows that Harvey's got to go and take care of business. So Harvey flies out there and he has a sit down. Oh, before I even get to that, this is when this whole Darby scene in question takes place. Because as they're discussing what's going on with his brother, they're also discussing whatever, what um, Harvey was talking about with Lewis. The scene before this, Harvey, Lewis was telling Harvey about some issues that he and Sheila were having conceiving. And the fact that Sheila wants him to go to, um, not a sperm egg, but a, um, a reproductive specialist to donate to see if, make sure that, you know, check him out, make sure his sperms are all, you know, working properly. But he is afraid that he won't be able to make a donation because Playboys and other things that they give you at, the, at those places don't interest him. His ways of getting aroused are different. So he's asking Harvey for advice, and at first Harvey's like, uh, yeah, I don't want to talk about this. That scene was so awkward, like, beyond awkward. <laughs> and I was actually kind of surprised that Harvey didn't blow him off, because in the past this would not be something that Harvey would ever discuss with Lewis. I mean, ever, in a million years. But character development... <laughs> Harvey has really changed a lot in the last couple of years, and he's gone to a point where he's comfortable now being able to be vulnerable. He didn't necessarily tell Lewis the truth, but he told Lewis what he wanted to hear, something that would make him more comfortable. You know, he actually did something nice to help him out, which that's like a big deal for Harvey, especially that subject, you know? So he asks Harvey, what does he use to get in the moment? And Harvey says, oh, big juicy tomatoes. And of course, you know, that's the biggest load of bullshit in the world. But Lewis is the type of person that would buy it because it's coming from Harvey. He trusts Harvey implicitly. So anything that Harvey tells him, he's going to believe his gospel. He tells Lewis, just use something that makes you happy, something that you fantasize about every day. And what does Lewis love? Numbers, money, financials. So something like the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, you know, magazines that talk about powerful people, that talk about money, would be enough to get him going. <laughs> so he thanks Harvey and he leaves. And this is the conversation that Donna and Harvey are flirting around. The, the answer that he gave to Lewis, because she knows it's bullshit. She's like, you gotta be kidding me. Seriously, tomato. We both know that what gets you going is strawberries and milk cream. <laughs> and of course, we all know that this is a reference to the other time, 13 years ago, when they had their little night. Um, but Harvey says that he sees it as 12 and a half years ago and not 13. Now, I know this is something that doesn't seem that important, but for those that theorize that there is something going on here that is fishy, it can be surmised that it's been a couple of months since he has broken up with Paula. So, if he was counting his relationship with Paul in the, for in the time that he's known Donna, that would be 13 years since that other time. If he's not counting his relationship with Paula, 
it would be more like 12 and a half since the other time. So what are you trying to say, Carthy? Are you acting like Paula never happened? Just like she didn't even exist, like it wasn't even there to begin with? Is that what's going on? I've got to tell you, this whole scene from beginning to end is probably one of the best Darby moments they have ever had. And I'm telling you, they've had a lot of great Darby moments from the flashback when they first met, which is, oh my God, whoever shot that scene is the best director ever. And of course the kiss, but well, the fantasy kiss and the real one. But this seems different. The, the whole, the vibe that this scene gave off, the vibe that the two of them gave off, lends a lot of credence to the theory that there is something going on between them. And that is there, is there a distinct possibility that they might already be together because the way that he approached her that morning when he first showed up, the way he was with her. Now I know before she became COO and before she left him to go work for Lewis and all that crap happened, they were like this. But there was a level of intimacy between them that was just not there. Even when they were at their closest, there was a level of intimacy that was not there. And it was mostly because she would not allow it. They, they had had that agreement, like a wall. They rarely ever even touched because that was something that they agreed on after that other time. But now there is a level of comfort between them that is so intimate. I mean, yes, they haven't really, like, he's, he doesn't like tap her shoulder or anything, or he doesn't squeeze her shoulder or hold her hand, but the looks exchanged between them, the flirtatious little smiles, the, the soft way that they speak to each other, it seems so obvious that there is something going on. Like, there is a closeness there that wasn't there before. And I'm not talking about after they patch things up after he broke up with Paula, because even after that happened, there was, you know, they were okay and they were kind of getting back to the way things were, but it wasn't entirely there. And now this episode is just like, it seemed like after, actually, no, not just this episode, this whole season has been a shift. It seems like after Mike and Rachel left, something shifted between the two of them. Seriously, something shifted. which really lends a lot of belief to the idea that they might have been together all along and just not said anything. I don't know if this is for certain. If it is, all I'll say is, Korsh, you're an asshole, <laughs> because that's just not fair. Fair. <laughs> but um, it definitely was appreciated, the scene. I would hope it's not just bait because a lot of the fans have gotten much too used to bait, 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 and then switch and nothing ever happens. I really do hope that it's not more of that. I think we, after all these years, we deserve better. These two definitely deserve better. But it was just so like, it was crackling the way that they were staring at each other. You can even see from the picture behind me, like <clears throat> something's going on. You could just feel it. It was palpable in the air. It was just thick. Like you just, you couldn't deny that. But anyhow, she tells me, you know, you know, go, go take, take care of business. You know, we will handle things here. So he flies up there to talk to Marcus and he meets him at Marcus's restaurant. And 
Marcus reiterates, yeah, I know, I slept with somebody, but it was only one time, I swear, I fucked up, I know I did, but I love my, my wife, I don't want her to do this, but she, she's immovable, she's so angry, and, and she just wants it over. So, at first, Harvey is furious, because you know that's Harvey's sticking point. F fidelity is Harvey's big sticking point, like, he can't understand why Marcus would do that, considering what happened between their parents. But Har Marcus is not asking to be judged. He's just asking for Harvey's help. So against his better judgment, Harvey is like, okay, but I'm doing this because you're my family. Kids are my family, and I don't want to see you guys get hurt. So he goes with Marcus to meet with his, his wife and his wife's attorney. And this woman is like a bulldog. She apparently sent him a motions letter before this meeting ever happened with a bunch of sanctions on it about stuff that he wouldn't be able to, to do. <clears throat> <coughs> and also sanctioning him for speaking with Marcus's wife because when he got there after he spoke with Marcus he went to he went to the house to see her but he didn't go there as her, Marcus's lawyer he went there as her brother-in-law you know to talk to her and make sure she was okay and to see if they could figure things out you know to offer her some sort of comfort and but she was just like, I can't talk to you. My lawyer says, I can't talk to you. You don't, you can't be here, RV. I mean, thank you for, for coming and helping Marcus, but you just can't be here. And obviously she told her attorney that Harvey had been there. And the attorney had some wild hair up, up her ass thinking that, you know, Harvey had done that on purpose to make the situation worse. And he wasn't doing that. He didn't go there as her, as a lawyer, he went there as Harvey, his family. So the lawyer says that Marcus's wife wants sole custody and they will determine visitation rights at a later time. And he's like, whoa, hold up. That's not something we ever even discussed. So they're battling back and forth, trying to figure it, trying to come up with some sort of agreement and nothing seems to be working and they start yelling at each other and Harvey is like I you know I can't believe that you're you're gonna ruin your entire marriage for a one-time mistake I mean he knows he did something stupid but he loves you he wants to work this out can we try to come to some sort of agreement and she's like wait hold on what what he said this was about a woman what apparently that whole sound story that Marcus told to Harvey about having slept with somebody was a bunch of bullshit. So Harvey is walking into this meeting having no idea what is going on because he's been sold a complete lie by his brother. And now he's even more pissed because he told Marcus at the outset, you have, if you want me to help you, you've got to tell me the truth. If you don't tell me the truth, I can't help you. I can't walk in there and not know the whole story. Or else I'm not, I won't, won't be able to fight for you properly. So now he feels like an idiot. He feels like he's been set up. The meeting kind of implodes. They go their separate ways. And Harvey demands that Marcus tell him the whole truth. So Marcus tells him the real reason was that he'd been going he had developed a gambling problem and he'd been seeking help for it going to meetings but then he lost a lot of money and he also got caught I think on a gambling website or somewhere maybe at the restaurant by his daughter and he lied to her and he also told her not to tell their mother not to tell her mother what what he was doing so in point of fact, he had his daughter lie for him, which that right there was enough to set Harvey off because 
their mother did the same thing to him. When he caught her sleeping with another man, she made him lie to their father. And that is something Harvey cannot tolerate. So it was bad enough that Marcus liked Harvey, but the fact, I mean, the gambling thing was not that, was not even the big deal. He could have lived with that. The fact was that he didn't seem to trust his own brother enough to tell him the truth. And he also had his own child lie for him. That was beyond the pale. Harvey was livid and said, you know what? You made your own bed. You're going to fucking lie in it. Goodbye. And he walks back to his hotel ready to pack up and leave. He's done. <clears throat> and while he's there packing, his mother shows up. They're, they still talk, which is good. It's slow going. It's a process, you know. It's been, you know, it's it's 20 years of animosity and a lot of anger that's having to be dealt with. So it's not something that you can do overnight. It takes time. But it's good that he can still, that despite what's going on with Marcus, that he can still talk to her. And, you know, that that relationship is still reasonably good. Um, she is, goes to the hotel to try to talk to Harvey and get him to understand that Marcus didn't mean to make this mistake, that it was a mistake and that he's human and that it had this, you know, human beings fuck up, but that he loves his wife and he doesn't want to lose his children. And that regardless of what Marcus might've done, don't, let, don't let your anger cloud your judgment when it comes to helping him because that's the first thing for Harvey to do to pop off and get angry instead of looking at it from a different perspective. It, that's what he did when his mother cheated on his father. He stayed and he didn't just get angry. He stayed angry for over 20 years. And it was only recently that he managed to have any kind of renewed relationship with his mother. And I don't think she wants to see that happen between him and Marcus because of the mistakes that she made. She, she says to him, and this is rightly so, that the reason why he, he did that is because he learned it from me. It's not his fault. I mean, yes, it's his fault for fucking up, but he didn't have a very good role model to learn from in the first place. So she, it's good that she bears responsibility for some of that mess. And she begs him, she's like, please, Harvey, don't, don't do this. This is your brother. This is your family. It, you know, at least try, even if it doesn't work, at least try for the children's sake, if nothing else. So he gets his better judgment. He's like, all right, all right, fine. So he had, he has his mother take a seat and I wasn't sure what they were doing at first until the next scene. I was like, Oh, Harvey, you dirty dog. But Marcus wanted the howitzer. That's what, that's what he got. He had his mother sit down with him at the hotel and detail to him every instance that she wasn't there for the children, anything bad, like, if one of the children got sick and she couldn't be there to pick them up from school or child got hurt and she wasn't there at the hospital, anything that would make her look bad. Just all the dirt. And he's got it in this, in this paper. He brings it to Marcus and he says, I have a surefire way to get her to back down, but she's not going to like it. But right now it's the only way because she's got you by the balls. So he gives Marcus the paper, and as soon as Marcus sees it, he's like, dude, no. I mean, I know that I fucked up, but she's not. I know that we we have issues, but she's not a bad mom. She loves her kids. You can't, you can't do that. I'm not going to let you do that. I'm not going to let you shit all over her just to get my kids back. That It's not worth it. She doesn't deserve that, especially after everything, after all I've done. You've got to find a different way. And Harvey's like, there is no other way. She's got you. 
he says, well, you know what? You're the closer, find one. So he brings the letter to Marcus's wife, who's watching the kids at a baseball game. And he says, look, I know you don't want me talking to you, and I'm not gonna try to persuade you to do anything you don't wanna do. I just want you to know that I gave this to Marcus, and I told him it was a surefire way to gain custody, but he wouldn't let me use it because he still loves you. He's always loved you, and he doesn't want to lose you, and he doesn't want to lose his children. So, can you at least try to think about maybe the possibility, if not working things out, not working out between you, then maybe work out a better way for the children, you know? And it, she's kind of surprised when she learns that he, that Marcus wouldn't let Harvey use all that dirt. And she agrees that she'll at least think about it. So that part of the story ends there and Harvey returns home. So I don't know if Marcus and his wife are going to get divorced, but it seems like Harvey managed to get them to at least start talking again, which is, that's the important thing. I have, I know Marcus loves, loves his wife and loves his family, so I'm reasonably certain that they'll work things out. They might live separately for a little while until the dust blows over, but I think she understands and she knows it's true what Harvey's saying, that this little mistake he made is not enough of a reason to destroy your, to you know, implode your whole marriage over, that there's got to be some other way. <clears throat> Although Marcus definitely has a lot of making up to, because that's some serious bullshit. You don't ask your kids to fucking lie for you, ever. It, I'm not saying that it's going to be easy for him to get back into her good graces and working things out. It's going to take time, and they might be separated for a while until your you know enough trust is built between them where they can come back together. But at least they'll be amicable enough and you know to talk it through and not be screaming at each other. So B storyline, we have Alex and Samantha and Alex's daughter Joy. So. Joy is 15, she's a freshman in high school, and she's kind of going through a rebellious early teenage phase where, you know, you, you're not cool, I don't want to deal with you, whatever. And she feels like she has to do all this, she has to have this tough act, like I gotta do all this super cool shit to fit in with, with everybody, and you know, if you're boring, you're not cool, whatever, you gotta prove to me that you're cool by doing something really crazy. Because in her mind, that's what makes a person cool, is doing shitty, shady things. He, Alex is trying to get her to talk to him about why she got suspended. He doesn't exactly know the details, although he should as a parent. You would think if the kid got suspended, the school would tell him why. I, I, I'm not, that doesn't quite jive with me. As a parent, and having worked in the school system before, I know for a fact that if a child gets suspended for any reason, the parents are always notified and told why. Unless she did not tell the administration what she did, but even still, I mean, it doesn't make sense. You, you, you can't have a big blank part of your suspension paperwork that has no reason for it. There has to be a reason for getting suspended. So it doesn't make sense to me that Alex wouldn't know what it was. I think he more wants to know why she's doing what she's doing, but he can't get her to open up to him. So he tries to talk to her, but it doesn't work. She, he, she blows him off. So he 
tries to talk to Gretchen because Gretchen is an older woman. She's got kids of her own and she's got that sassy, you know, sassy lady that we all love. Love you, Gretchen. But Gretchen's like, hey, pfft, honey child, I got kids of my own. No, if she ain't talking to you, what makes you think she gonna talk to me? I'm older than you. Pfft, she she gonna blow me off. Mm -mm. You need to find the coolest person in the building. That's the person she's going to talk to. So, who does he go to? Samantha. Because she's got that kind of personality. And he figures she can make an impact. So he tells her the story. And he says, to her, look, I got meetings and stuff that I have to go to today, but I don't want her to be by herself. And there's going to be some time where I have to be out of the building. So can you just look after her since you're doing most of your work from here today? At first, she's kind of reluctant because she's really busy. She's tackling a client. Uh, she's trying to defend a client who's uh, being railroaded by another company who is who made some who ripped off a medication that her client's company had made and is selling it as their own. But she says she'll give it a shot anyway. So she sits down and tries to talk to Joy, and Joy immediately blows her off. You ain't cool, whatever, you know. So she says to her, well, your dad told me that you got suspended, so you tell me yours, I'll tell you mine. Now, before we even go any further with this, at first when this happened, I was like, mm, mm-mm, mm-mm, because no one for sure knows her story. Every person that she's talked to, she sold them a different lie. I can understand her doing that shit with clients to get ahead, but I have real, real problems with her selling a lie to a kid. Like, that's not right. I was hoping that whatever came out of her mouth, there would at least be some set semblance of truth in it. It's like, please, Samantha, please do not lie to her. She's a kid. I mean, come on. She's a kid. This is not a client. It's a child. At least be quasi-truthful, you know? And I think for the first time since she's been on the show, she actually was. I mean, she didn't, she probably didn't tell the whole entire story because she's not, she, she's not the type who would allow herself to be that vulnerable <laughs> yet. Remember, she's like Harvey when Harvey first started working for Pearson Inspector, or for per Pearson Hardman. She's at, she's at that stage. The hands off stage, you know, the success is everything stage. So she tells Joy that she stole the principal's car, and that's what got her suspended. So Joy's like, Wow, oh, that's cool. Oh, you cool. So this kind of opens her up to, like, Oh, you're cool now. So she shows her picture on her phone that. She poured some sort of bleach or chemical mixture all over the football field and made some kind of wordage or something on the football field. What the reason was behind it, she never really explains. And they kind of bond over their mutual uh, <laughs> mischievousness. <laughs> so... Instead of having her sit around and not really doing much of, of anything, Samantha says, you know what? I've got something that you can do for me. Because I've got to deal with this client. But I can't do it by myself. I need some help. And Joy at first is like, huh? So Samantha takes her to a coffee shop. And at this coffee shop, the client and his lawyer just happen to be sitting there discussing the case in broad daylight, in the wide open for anybody in God to hear. <laughs> so she tells her, this is on your dad's dime. Because I think that she might have, I think Joy might have stolen his credit card or something. Either that or Alex gave her some, some money to spend. Because she doesn't seem to care about what happens with her dad. Well, he's rich. Whatever, you know. So she tells her to go to the counter and get some croissants and some donuts. Oh, and the cappuccino machine, too. 
And while she's there, turn the recorder on her phone on and record what they're, the conversation. Or at least to imply that she is, because she doesn't actually do it. She Legally, she can't record another person's conversation. So she overhears them discussing the case and admitting to the crime that they committed ripping off this person's patent. So later on that day, when the client, when the, the company, the, the CEO and his attorney come in for a deposition, she just lays that shit out for him. Just lays that shit out and says, you know, what if I happen to have a recording of you admitting in public that you, uh, that you guys stole this man's patent, ripped off the medicine that he made and are now selling it as your own product. And they're looking at him like, they're, they're looking at her like, like she's nuts. Oh, but you forget. <coughs> Next time a word of advice, if you ever go out in public to like say a coffee shop, don't discuss work in public where anybody can fucking hear you. And that's when they know that they, they've been asked out. And at first he says to her, you recorded us. That's illegal. You can't record a private conversation. She's very up, up front. I didn't record anything. But I definitely was within earshot. And so was she. See, you weren't really conspicuous talking about the case in public. She really shouldn't have been. Just a thought. Word advice. And that's when they know that they really don't have a leg to stand on, so. She crushes them and that case. Too sweet. And Joy just looks at her like, oh my god, you're the coolest person in the world. <laughs> so she kind of manages to not only earn Joy's trust, but earn her respect. So she become, they kind of become sort of friends. <laughs> and as a result of that, she, uh, Joy goes to her father and is extremely excited about coming there the next day to be able to do even more. Now, Alex has no idea that this has been going on. None. And when he finds out from Joy that this is what she and Al and, and um, Samantha did, he's pissed off. Because <clears throat> he feels like Samantha is using his daughter to commit, you know, something very close to a crime. <clears throat> and he goes to her office and he gets straight up in her face about this. He said, um, I'm sorry, you need to stay away from my daughter because that shit's fucked up. She's a kid. You have no right to be involving her in your case, in your business, and you certainly have no right to make her do something that's quasi not even legal just so you can stick it to your, you know, just so you can win a case. And he pretty much gets all up, all up in her business, threatening her to stay away from, from his daughter. And all she can say to him is, that, you know, I was just teaching, I was just showing her what the, what the real world is like. And hopefully that'll make her stop doing whatever it is that, that she's doing in, in school. And Alex says to her, that's not what a parent does. parent doesn't teach their kid what the world is like. They teach their, their kid what the world could be like. Although, but you know what? I, I kind of get what Alec, what Samantha is trying to do. She's trying to give Joy a reality slap a little. But she didn't do anything that would get Joy into any kind of trouble. I mean, I know Samantha can be a piece of work, but I also know she wouldn't do anything that would hurt an innocent person, least of all a child. 
So I think Alex might have jumped the gun just a smidge. <clears throat> and he does re re he does realize that at the end of the episode, he kind of he jumped the gun just a little, and he 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 got in her face when he really shouldn't have, and he went to apologize to her about it and to actually thank her for um, doing such a great job for joining and helping to get her to open up. And now it seems like their relationship was a little bit is better now than it was before. Because there's a scene in the in the in the employee lounge where Joy comes in on the second day and she's super excited about doing, you know, whatever it is that Samantha's got next. And S Samantha's really, for the first time, very subdued, which is not normal for her. She's usually very in your face. But this time she says to her, uh, yeah, um, there's not going to be anything going on today or ever. Um, you need to go back to your dad. And she's like, why? I thought we were having fun. Are we going to take on another client, you know? And she says, well, your dad made it very apparent that it wasn't a good idea for us to work together like that. So she's upset because she enjoyed working with Samantha. And she says, well, I don't care what my father says. And it's not like I'm going to do what he says. Anyway, and she's like, you know, you really shouldn't talk about your father like that. He's, you know, he's, he's, a good man and she seems to act like all her father cares about is the firm and that it doesn't matter what she does because he's rich and he'll take care of it anyway as if that's all his worth is is his money and his law degree and she, but she really sets her straight and says look your father is not just his degree or the amount of money that he has in the bank your father asked me to talk to you because he cares about you. So why don't you go and actually sit down and talk to him? And that's kind of what finally got them talking. So this is why Alex had to go and apologize to her and uh, thank her for helping him out. And as a result of that apology, he feels compelled to tell her about the name partnership offer and she doesn't know that Harvey had already promised the name partnership to Alex but since Samantha already told Alex that Zane had promised the name partnership to her he feels it's only right for him to tell her what was going on so now that they both know the stakes she says point blank are you, you gonna back down He's like, you know, well, may the best lawyer win in that regard. <laughs> so I don't know how it's going to go, but I'll tell you, considering who the players are, they're, they're not going to go down without a fight. That's for damn sure. They can be friendly, but at the end of, at the, end of the day, <laughs> it's going to be nasty when it comes to whose name's going to go up there. I feel like they should just have both names up there, but then it'd be too busy, too crowded. Zane, Spectre, Ritt, Williams, Wheeler, too much. <laughs> it's going to come off like anybody can have their uh, names up there. So, this is definitely just the beginning of the story. That's for sure. But I have to commend Katherine Heigl for her... Um, her acting in this at uh, this episode it was the first time where we got to see a more intimate personal side of the Samantha Wheeler character normally it's all business <coughs> <coughs> and I feel like the story she told Joy about stealing the principal's car I think that was true I think she was a bit of a she was a delinquent I it I really do think that. I don't think she had a lot of parental supervision when she was a kid. It seems to me like Zane was that father figure in her life that helped to set her straight. Because she says to Joy that she didn't just get suspended, she got expelled. 
which makes sense. I mean, you steal a person's car, you could go to juvie for that. So to only get suspended, that seemed, that seemed a little light to me. <clears throat> so, on to the third story. Okay, this is where I have to knock off some points, because everything else in this episode was on point. But the third part of the story I had issues with, and it's because of one thing and one thing only. Sheila motherfucking Zass. Okay. As this season has gone on, the character of Sheila Zass, I don't know if it was Korsh's intention to assassinate the shit out of this character or what, but actually, even since last season, it... I've had, I've had issues with the Sheila's ass character almost from the beginning. Because she seems very manipulative. Even when she and um, Lewis were originally together at the beginning of the show, she always seemed very man manipulative. I know she says that she's attracted to powerful men. And because Lewis is in a position of power at the firm, that's what attracts her. But I feel like, in a lot of ways, it's the only thing that attracts her. And if Lewis had any other job, she would not give him a second glance. Which saddens me, because, okay, Lewis might not have Harvey's looks, but he's got a good heart. And... I think he would make a really good husband to any girl, to any woman who would give him a chance. I mean, <clears throat> but I also think that Lewis wears his heart on his sleeve a lot. And it tends to get him in trouble because he desperately, and this stems from a lot of what he went through as a kid, he desperately wants to be loved. It's not easy when you're, when you grow up being a little overweight and awkward and kind of nerdy and you've got a sister who's, you know, the hottest thing on two legs that every guy would give their left arm to, to date. You always feel like you're in her shadow. I can see how difficult life would have been for him because he would have had people claiming that they want to be his friend, but only doing that as a, and using him as the doorway to get to his sister, which is not right, you know. Lewis deserved better than that. So, his relationship with Sheila, for me, has kind of been up and down. I do believe that he loves her very much. Even when he was with the other girl, the other Lady Tara, the one that was married, decided to have a relationship with him anyway, which I, I did not agree with. <laughs> um, I felt like he was so desperate to have someone love him that he was willing to compromise his own ideals, uh, that he was willing to compromise himself and his own morals. <laughs> Yeah, I really do not agree with. Uh, but anyway, I remember when everything was good with Lewis and Sheila in the beginning. And then he had told her that he wanted to have children. And she straight up got in his face and said that she did not want to have kids ever. Not just with him, but with not, not have kids at all. And the crushed look on Lewis's face. And then she just dumped him flat simply because they could never agree. And she always put it on Lewis. Like, <coughs> she acted as though Lewis was the immovable one. And that Lewis was the one that had to compromise all of his positions to be with her. And that she didn't have to compromise anything to be with him. Nothing at all. It never seemed right to me. So 
so they were apart for a good long while. Let's face it, she was also highly responsible for sending Mike to prison, or at least getting him ar arrested. And then when they got back together, I mean, when I see the relationship now, it worries me because I'm so afraid that the only reason she's with him is because her biological clock is ticking and she just wants a child so desperately. So what's going to happen when she gets pregnant and has her baby? Is she just going to dump Lewis because she doesn't need him anymore? Because the child is all she really wants? Because when she talks about the relationship, she doesn't talk about it in terms of the two of them. She talks about it in terms of the baby and what she needs. She was angry at Lewis in this episode because he wouldn't give up mudding in order to raise the percentage, the likelihood percentage that they could get pregnant. Because they'd only just started trying to have a child. And as a mother myself, I know it is not that easy to get pregnant unless you're just wildly fertile. You also have to take into consideration Sheila and Lewis's age. They're not exactly young sprites either. They're both, and they're probably mid, maybe even late forties. So the fact that when it doesn't happen like this, she gets all, I'm like, Sheila, give it at least a couple weeks to a month. And then if something doesn't happen, then you can, you know, it's only been, what, a week? I mean, come on, give it more time. And then she immediately jumps to the conclusion that it's got to be something wrong with Lewis. I mean, yes, she said she was having herself checked out too, but she was adamant that maybe that the possibility was that Lewis's swimmers weren't working and that she pretty much forced him to go to the doctor. She even made the appointment and said, you, you will go. I mean, Lewis obviously did not feel comfortable doing that. I think if she had suggested to him, hey, maybe we should go and get looked at just in case, make sure there's nothing wrong, I think he would have been more amenable to it. But to demand that he go and make the appointment for him without his consent, without even asking him first if that's what he wanted, and just forcing him to go do it, because it was something he was obviously not comfortable with doing. Sheila is really driving me nuts. So he goes to the doctor, he does what he's what he's gotta do. And and she the results show that there's nothing wrong with Lewis, but the, the doctor tells him that he would have a greater percentage of impregnating Sheila if he gave up mudding temporarily. Now, Lewis is a very anxious person. He gets anxiety. That's why he has, that's why he drinks coffee. That's why he goes mudding because it helps him to relax. That's why he goes to the, to the shrink. He does all those things as self-care so that he can relax because he gets, he has an anxiety. It used to be crippling for him, but he's made a lot of strides. And it's a difficult thing for him to have to give that up. And he doesn't know how to even start. He's not saying that he won't, but it's not something he can just overnight, boom, done. It's something he has to work his way into. It's like asking someone who... It's asking anybody to give up something that they, you know, are dedicated to. It takes time. It's not something you can just shut off. And for Lewis, who uses that as a means of, a serious means of self-care and of therapy, it, that's, it's even more difficult. And she doesn't, she actually, she doesn't even care. Like, it's all about her. Oh, how could you not do that? You know, how could you say that you're ready to be a, a father if you won't do something as small as, as giving up? Mudding, and I know as a mom, believe me, I know what women give up to have children caffeine and their body's not their own anymore, and the pain of giving birth. I get it, okay? I'm all for women power, but there has to be a give and take somewhere. And all she's doing, all she, she seems to be doing, is taking. She doesn't even attempt to understand Lewis's point of view in this. 
when you're in a relationship, there has to be communication, 50-50 both ways. And it doesn't, it never seems like it is that way be between them. It always seems like it's whatever Sheila wants goes. And it's actually kind of ironic when you consider that Sheila likes powerful men. And he's never in any kind of position of power when he's with her unless they're having sex. That's only because she allows it. So it makes you wonder why she's even with him in the first place. So she gets up all in his face. Maybe you're not mature enough to have a child if you can't even give up money. And he's trying. He said that he would do whatever he had to do. And she kept telling him that, you know, it's not temporary. It's just, it's not permanent. It's just a temporary thing until we get pregnant. Then you can go mudding all you want. And he says to her, well, I can't just not go. I would have to give up my membership entirely because the temptation is just too great. Because as I said before, he's a very anxious person and he needs that to relax. So the temptation to go do that would be too great for him to just, just stop doing it. So he apologizes to her and begs her forgiveness <coughs> and ends his membership with the spa. Fortunately, you know, Don is there and she gives him, it's not coffee, but it's some kind of something or other that he can put his finger in. It's the, the aroma and the heat simulates the comfort of the spa for him because he's given up caffeine too and stuff like that to give them a better chance to conceive. So fortunately, you know, Don is a good friend to, to help him out with that. So yeah, um, really starting to hate Sheila with a passion. This chick is like driving me nuts. She's, she's being really horrible to Lewis and Lewis doesn't deserve it. Um, so that is everything for episode five. This was a really great episode and um, I really liked the family theming of the three storylines. It seems like as the season is going on, things are getting much more cohesive. Catherine Heigl, there was some bumpy roads with her fitting in at first, but she seems, it's, that seems to be more fluid now. Um, I don't, she's at least getting along with some characters. I don't know about her relationship with Harvey yet because they haven't really uh, had a lot of interaction. I'm interested to see what things uh, would be like between her and Donna because they did not get off on the right foot at all. And uh, We'll see as the episodes go on. I know next week is going to be awkward to say the least. The pro has something to do with couples therapy between Lewis and Harvey. This is definitely going to be hysterical. <laughs> Um, I guess the two of them are fighting over something. I don't know, but Lewis feels like they have some shit to work out. So he sends the two, he, told, he tells them they need to go to see his therapist. And you know how Harvey is with therapy. It was hard enough for him to go on his own, but to have to go to Lewis's therapist, yeah, that's going to be funny <laughs> and incredibly awkward. All right, guys. Well, it's been long enough. I'll see you guys next week for episode six. And if you want more content, like, subscribe, more videos, watch them. I'll see you guys next week. Bye, guys.